it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome you here this evening and to introduce uh, Professor Simon Chadwick for his um, professorial lecture. Um, the professorial lectures is a very old tradition. It's actually one that fell into a bit of disuse here at the university and we restarted it uh, this year. So we're on a bit of catch up. So those of us that have joined the university in recent years have had the, the delight of, uh, of being able to do this and it's, it's come round to Simon's turn. Simon's gonna be talking about Asia's era how and why the global sport industry is pivoting eastwards and what it means for us. This is very much at the core of Simon's interest and expertise. Uh, I'm sure colleagues know that Simon's professor of sports enterprise has a major interest and is a, a world expert on the global sport industry and some of the challenges and changes that are happening in that industry and how that's affecting how we engage with sport and the sporting environment kind of more generally. He's written extensively uh, on sports business articles in places like Slow Management Review, The Wall Street Journal, writing for FT Prentice Hall. He's worked with companies like UEFA, MasterCard, FC Barcelona, Adidas, Nielsen, um, the Association of Tennis Professionals. Um, his current work is looking at sports sponsorship uh, and soft power, uh, and particularly the development of sport in the Gulf region. Some of you, I suspect most people in the room will know about, there's a major sporting event coming to the Gulf region uh, in, in, in just a few years' time, and that's having a, a particular impact, as well as China's quest uh, to become a leading sports nation. Uh, I know Simon to be engaging uh, a, a, an influential speaker. Uh, I'm looking very forward very much to hearing what he's got to say. And I'd like to welcome into the lectern, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so looking at the, uh, the audience tonight, this is a bit like my, uh, my football team. So I, I take the empty spaces as not an indictment of anyone, but the people who sat here, you know, hardcore fans. So welcome to the Fanatics tonight, and thank you for being here. That's uh, really good. Now, for those of you who, uh, who don't know me, there are actually quite a few people in the room who do know me. So for those of you who, uh, who don't know me, um, I am prone to uh, uh, Twitter. I do like to tweet. And uh, I, this caught my eye a while back. And so, obviously, I've had one introduction. Uh, if I was to introduce myself, that, that's how I'm going to be in introducing myself from now on. Um, I'm not quite sure what this means, but this is from a South African lamp post, and somebody sent it to me. So if you want to know, want to know what I do at Salford, um, that's what I do. I bring back Lost Lover. Okay, so if, if you've lost a lover, I bring back Lost Lover, uh, and those other things too. Now, the reason I mention Twitter in particular is because if you, uh, if you don't follow, just to, people always say, when, you give, when I say this about Twitter, they think I'm touting for business. Okay, I'm not touting for business. I don't need you to follow me. If you want to follow me, that's fine, but I don't need you to follow me. I'm not on a productivity bonus based on the number of followers. But I, I direct you to my, my Twitter uh, account simply because um, I don't tweet about personal stuff. So if you want to know what I had for lunch or what music I listen to or what car I drive, because that's the kind of questions that school kids ask their teachers, right? You know, what music do you listen to? Uh, have you got a girlfriend, sir? Um, so I don't tweet about any of that. What I do is, is, is I tweet about um, sport business management stories with a very particular slant. And fortunately for me, Salford begins with an S and so does Shanghai. So therefore, what I'm particularly interested in what, is what happens between Salford and Shanghai. Um, for me, today, a great day because Manchester City uh, bought a Chinese club, third division. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I could say about City and China and the club and what it all means. But suffice to say, that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in. And, and not whether Manchester City are going to win the Champions League or whether Pep Guardiola is the greatest coach ever. You know, these are really interesting things. But what I'm particularly interested in is, is organisations and companies and businesses and markets and industrial development and some politics and geopolitics thrown in there. 
So if you want to follow on Twitter, you can, but if you don't want to follow on Twitter, you don't. You've, had, you've, actually got, you've actually got your phone out there already. Thank you. Thank you. You do already? All right, okay. Well, double thank you then. So I'm guessing that for some of you in the room, you like a bit of Champions League football, and for the city, maybe not you, Jonathan, obviously, because... Uh, <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe in two or three weeks' time, you might love it again. But for the City fans in the room, you're probably thinking, Simon, just talk, get out of here, because we want to go and see the Schalke game. Um, so some of you probably like a bit of Champions League football. And some of you, when you watch your Champions League football, probably at half-time, um, you think, you know what, I quite, quite fancy a beer or, you know, Maybe after the game, get a beer, or before the game has taken place, you know, what am I, have a beer, get some cans in, watch the game. And of course, you might think about Heineken. And with Heineken, Dutch Brewery, Champions League sponsor, and essentially what, what that is about, is it, it, in sponsorship terms, it, it's, it's about brand awareness, it's about brand recall, it's about image transfer, so for those of you who are marketers in the room, for those of you who are, are business students or business academics in the room, you probably know this kind of sponsorship relationship. You know, it's, it's very, very commercial. And some of you, when you watch on TV as opposed to watching on YouTube, um, may well actually see the, the end credits and you get those little kind of 15 second or 10 second snips where you see the, he the Heineken uh, uh, logo come up and the, the Heineken name. Um, and hopefully you'll go out and buy Heineken. That's what Heineken want, and that's what UEFA is, is trying to help Heineken to do. You might also know this name. So if you watch Champions League football on TV, you might also know this name as well. And I'm guessing that most of you in the room probably did haven't ever, at half time, sat and watched a Champions League game and thought, you know what, I'm going to nip out and get a bit of, bit of Gazprom before the, uh, the, uh, the second half. Now, I, is, it, is there anybody in the room who's actually nipped out and bought a bit of Gazprom? Ever? Of course you haven't. Of course you haven't. Because this is a very, very different type of relationship between UEFA and Heineken than between Gazprom. So for those of you who don't know Gazprom, Gazprom is a 51% state-owned Russian gas company. And it doesn't sell anything to people like us. Essentially what it does is it sells um, gas to governments. Now I don't want to get into the whole thing about Gazprom. I could quite easily, and for those of you who follow on Twitter, you know that I like a bit of Gazprom on Twitter. It's a really, really interesting organization. I think its motives are really, really significant. Some of you, for those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, jo Donald Trump, Trump recently has talked about Europe's dependence upon Russian gas, and in particular the Germans. So if, uh, if there are any Germans in the room, you may well know that, that Donald Trump is, is chasing Andri Angela Merkel at the moment, really concerned about Ru uh, Germany's dependence on Russian gas. And yet somehow, Gazprom is a, a Schalke sponsor, Gazprom is a UEFA sponsor, uh, some of you will know it's also a Red, Red Star Belgrade sponsor. I could go on about Gazprom and I'm starting to go about, on about Gazprom and I shouldn't. But the reason I've shown you this slide is because for me, Gazprom epitomises really the eastward shift that we're beginning to see in, in sport more generally, but specifically in football. Now, for those of you who are not football fans in the room and are perhaps Formula One fans, you will know, for instance, that the Formula One calendar over the last 25 years, where you, you used to have a majority of races in Europe, now you've got a minority of races in Europe and a significant proportion, in fact, probably a majority of Formula One races now are being held in Asia. For those of you who are big Olympic Games fans or Winter Olympic Games fans, is Sochi Europe? Maybe, maybe not. It's right on the very edge. Uh, but certainly if we look at Pyeongchang last year in, uh, um, uh, for the Winter Games, we've got 2020 in Tokyo, we've got 2022 in Beijing, and so we've had a significant period of time when even the Winter, winter Games and, the, and Summer Games have, have been in Asia. So all of this is, is kind of part of this general um, pivot eastwards, as I would call it. Now, just to go back a little, 
you'll notice, Barbara, I actually changed the title. When you went out, I changed the title and I put your in brackets. Because I think there's something really, really interesting, not just about Asia, but about the Eurasian landmass. So since I first agreed to do this, which was back in the 17th century, I think, sometime, um, I actually thought a little bit more about it. And I put your in brackets for Eurasian, because clearly Russia is a, a very interesting country in the sense that it's partly in Europe, but significantly in Asia. But that landmass and what, for example, the Chinese government is trying to do across that landmass is interesting anyway from a general perspective, but I think particularly too from a sports perspective. So you'll see your in, in brackets as we go through. And if you want to have a fight about it later, we can. I'll meet you behind the, uh, the, the building and we'll fight it out between us. But what I would suggest to you is, is that you know, some of the things that I talk about tonight, there is that European, so the Eurasian landmass is, is Europe and Asia. So it does stretch from Manchester City right across to Sichuan and its feeder club or its franchise club that it bought today. And this, this is raising the kind of issues that we're, we're going to talk about. So, Gazprom, please, if you walk away from here tonight thinking, not remembering anything, please do at least remember there's something peculiar about Gazprom, something very different. It's not a, not a typical sponsorship in the conventional way that, that Heineken is. So what do we actually mean by the Eurasian model of sport? It's a, it's a tough one, it's a hard one, because Asia is huge. And, and clearly, you've got, you have China, you have Japan, you have Russia. But at the same time, you, for instance, have Azerbaijan. And for those of you who are um, football fans, you'll say, well, Azerbaijan are members of UEFA. They're not, they're not, that's not an Asian country. Well, technically, in geographic terms, it is. Then you've got Turkey. And Turkey's very, very interesting, certainly in sporting terms, partly in Asia, partly in Europe. Obviously, member, a member of UEFA in, in football. Uh, but again, geopolitically, very important got a very important, uh, a very interesting president who has a very particular view of the world, interesting international alliances, and so this sets an important context for Turkey. But I was trying to, to think about how do, I, how do I describe Asia in a nutshell? And so I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll take one country in particular, because I think this country um, is, again, like Gazprom, is interesting because it's typical in many ways and it characterises or helps to characterise what Asia and Asian sport is all about. So tonight's pub quiz question is, guess the country. Is it on the border with China? Now the, good, the, now the interesting thing is, m most of you couldn't tell me the flag. Don't be so enthusiastic. I'm going to come to you. Keep your hand down, and you're going to get your moment of glory in a moment. So most of you didn't actually know the, this country's flag. Now, if I was to show, this, show you the Stars and Stripes or the Union Jack straight away, you'd say, oh, United States or, or Britain. But most of you didn't even know. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. But you identified that it is... Qatar. Oh, the guy's a genius. Sorry, what's your name? Felix. Felix, you're a genius. It is Qatar. So I thought we'd look at Qatar in particular, and, and I'm going to draw from Qatar the strands that I think are important. So the next question is, for the next five seconds, what comes into your head? So three things, one thing, or two things, or three things that you know about Qatar. What do you know about Qatar? You don't need to shout out. You can just... So did you know where it was? Because there's actually quite a lot of people, if you, if you say to them, well, okay, you know about the Qatar, you know the name, but where is it? So you can see that Qatar is basically just there, right in the middle. You see Doha and Qatar. Now, again, if, if, um, if there are those of you in the room who didn't know where Qatar was, that's okay. I think that's perfectly acceptable. Why should you know where Qatar is? It's a very, very small country in the Middle East. It may well be that you have particular preconceptions of the Middle East. It may be that you think certain things about the role that Qatar plays in the world. 
and that's okay because that's your view and that's what you know and that's fine but I think the crucial thing about perhaps some of those things that you have in your mind about Qatar is exactly why Qatar is investing heavily in sport just as a quick aside and I'm a big one for quick asides if you think about Brazil And you think about what, you see, what you're seeing in Brazil, it's, it's, it's beaches, and it's sun, and it's sea, and it's sand, and it's sex. And then you think about Brazilian football. It's just cool, right? Brazilian football's fantastic. And Brazil's got to be a great country. And what the Qataris want you to do is they want you to think about Qatar in the same way. Maybe not certain elements that I described, maybe the sex bit in particular, but... What they want is they want to use sport as a means through which to project an international image. They want people to know where the country is. They want people to know what the country stands for. They want, they, they want people to attribute certain qualities and characteristics to the country, and they're using sport to do that. But it's not just the Qataris. The Chinese are doing it, and others are doing it, and we'll, we'll talk about that in due course. You may have seen it just as desert. And if for anybody who's been to Qatar, I have lots of times, and quite a lot of it is desert. And again, one of the things that it is trying to do is not just to break down the image that it's desert, but also to use sport as a means through which to, to, to um, instigate and sustain development, economic development, social development, um, industrial development. Some of you might have said oil. If you said oil, gas, gas is the big thing. Now the interesting thing about gas is that the Qataris have got lots of it, just as the Russians have got lots of it. And one of the, uh, the important takeaways from tonight is that Russia is the, the world's biggest producer of liquefied natural gas. Uh, Qatar is the second biggest producer of liquefied natural gas. And so the, a lot of the, uh, the, the money that is being spent by Russia and Qatar on sport is coming from gas. Now, you probably already know this, but if you think about the oil and gas, gas nations, you think about the likes of Qatar, uh, Russia, and others, and their investments in sport, not just in football, but elsewhere. For example, Bahrain owns the McLaren F1 team. You obviously have uh, the Abu Dhabi government owns Manchester City. So these fit the, the, the profile, these countries fit the profile of tonight's lecture, the, 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 the focus of tonight's lecture. Some of you might have thought about, I think this is actually Egypt. <laughs> so some of you might have thought about Muslim Brotherhood and might have thought about international terrorism. And this is part of the Qatar story too, certainly the sporting story, in the sense that what Qatar is trying to do diplomatically is to ensure that they hedge between different groups. But in terms of how you, um, uh, how they deal with that, uh, there are also security issues, there are security issues around the World Cup and, and so on. But I think one of the things that I want you to, to take away again, one of the other th takeaway points is is that essentially Qatar is using sport as a way of dealing with issues such as terrorism, building social cohesion, addressing issues of security, but also engaging in diplomacy, sports diplomacy, as a, as a means of preventing terrorist attack. Now just on that, so supposedly there's never been a terrorist attack in Qatar. So all the stories that you hear about, it's going to be terrible, you know, there's going to be security issues. There was a guy who drove a car into the National Theatre about 10 years ago, and the official version was he was mentally unstable. Some people in Qatar say that he was, he was a terrorist. Um, but Qatar has, has done very, very well in controlling or addressing these issues, and one of the ways in which they've done that is through sport. Otherwise, you probably thought about the World Cup. And if you thought about the World Cup, 
you may well have thought about immigrant construction workers. One of the interesting things about Qatar is that uh, it's got a, an incredibly disparate population. And I'll talk about it again in just a moment, but there are only something like 250,000 Qataris in the world. It's just incredible. If you think about it, they're, they're staging the World Cup. They've got the World Athletics Championship this year um, in September. Uh, they have a, an annual Tour of Qatar cycle race. They've got a MotoGP race. They own Paris Saint-Germain. They're investing heavily in, for example, uh, equine sports, for those of you who are into horse racing. And yet there are only 250,000 Qataris. So in that population of 2.5 million that is Qatar, only 10% is Qatari. The remaining people are immigrants, construction workers, Europeans, um, North Americans. So again, in terms of the role that sport plays, it's about the social cohesion of the population and the, and the identity that that population has. Now, just to give you a couple more slides before I, I'll, I will show some text, it's not just all pictures. But this is Doha today. So what I want you to do is to keep an eye on this building here. So this is the Sheraton Hotel. Okay, so this is, this is now, actually it's, a, it's, it's probably about five or six years ago, but this is the Sheraton Hotel. This is 1971. Uh, for those of you who haven't spotted it, that's the Sheraton Hotel. Okay, so that's Doha now. That's Doha in 1971. And 1971 was actually a very important year for Qatar. Because it was at that point that um, it gained independence from Britain and effectively took control of its own gas and oil revenues. So just to go back to that again. So essentially, this 1971 was a really important year. Um, it was the point at which it gained independence from Britain. It took control of its own gas and oil revenues. And the country took the decision to utilize those gas and oil revenues as the basis for uh, one example, which is to invest in sport. So what I want to do now is, is to kind of just run, run through quickly for you what Qatar is all about and, and to give you a sense of how, where this all came from. So it, for those of you who are asking, well, where, where did Qatar come from? How did this all happen? Well, the British were very helpful um, in engaging with the Qataris to help them spell, spend their gas and oil revenues, uh, which essentially meant that up to, to 1971, uh, Qatar wasn't really in control of, of those revenues. But following the, the independence from Britain, um, they were be able to, to begin spending. And since then, what they've done, as we've already said, is to be produced, become uh, a major producer of gas. By 2024, uh, Qatar wants to become the world's leading producer of gas. We said at the moment it's Russia. Uh, it produces very little oil, for those of you who, uh, who, who perhaps thought it was oil earlier. Just to say that on, uh, on oil, Qatar recently left OPEC. And for those of you who take, uh, pay close attention to the region, you will know that there's a big feud going on with Saudi Arabia, etc., etc. But essentially, what I'm trying to, to say to you is, to go back to 1971, the country was desert. Potentially had lots of money, but it was desert. And yet, there were huge reserves um, of oil and gas, particularly under the, the, uh, the, the Persian Gulf, or, or uh, the Gulf of Arabia, as, it, as it's sometimes called. An interesting one for you as well, one of the biggest gas fields in the world is shared by Qatar and Iran. Iran, as you can imagine, is, uh, is in conflict with, with the United States. The Qatari Football Association has already signed a deal with uh, the Iranian Football Association to use Iranian territory 
for training camps for the 2022 World Cup. And this is not the main point of tonight's lecture, but look ahead to 2022. There's going to be a whole heap of trouble around Trump and the United States and Iran and Qatar's relationship with Iran and the Saudi Arabian feud. There's a whole bunch of things there. And I think for those of you who are sport business students or people with an interest in sport business or an interest in the World Cup or an interest in sport more generally, that's something to, 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 to look out for. So a country that was desert, wasn't in control of its oil and gas revenues, huge natural reserves of oil and gas, and what the country very rapidly has done is to capitalise upon uh, those, those gas revenues in particular to become effectively the richest country in the world. Now, for those of you who have not been to, to, to Qatar, just to say, you, if, I, if I'm born again, I'm coming back as a Qatari. Because I think to be born as a Qatari right now, uh, you want for nothing. So as you can see there, $129,000 per capita income each year. For those of you who don't know what the, uh, the British per capita income figure is, it's something about $40,000, I think. So you, you're talking about maybe three, possibly four times um, as wealthy as, as, uh, as in Britain. Huge growth figures, although obviously has, has slowed down. But here is a country that okay, was desert, became independent, large gas reserves, seeking to develop, particularly seeking to develop because people don't know, they know its flag, they think the country's desert, they think the country's associated with terrorism, um, they don't really understand where it is. And so what they have is now is what they call their 2030 national vision. So taking their natural resources, taking their need for identity, I'm going to say, uh, use the phrase nation brand. And again, if you think about brand Brazil and Brazilian football straight away, you're all making, you're all making conclusions. You, you've got an image in your head of Brazilian football. Qatar doesn't have that image. Qatar doesn't have a, a, an established image in people's minds. And when people do have an image of Qatar, it's very negative. So there is something about brand Qatar, there is something about uh, the, the identity of the, the country, but they have a 2030 national vision. And so I guess the essence of this and the takeaway from this slide is, is countries like, like Qatar and others, and I'm going to come to the others in a while, countries like Qatar have a vision of where they want to go to. And they also have a vision of how they're going to get there. And in Qatar's case, one of the strategic pillars, so to, to go back to this, Qatar wants to develop economically, it wants to develop socially, it wants to develop its human resources, and it wants to develop environmentally, which is an interesting one that I don't know if we're going to have time to talk about tonight, but certainly it wants to uh, develop environmentally. But I'd invite the question is, if you are British, for example, What's the national vision of Britain? I don't know. I, mean, I don't think anybody knows in Britain. I know. What's the vision for the next 30 days? Um, I don't know. But uh, this is really, really significant because if you look at the kind of countries that I'm going to mention later, like Qatar, like Abu Dhabi, like Dubai, like China, they will have a national, they have written national visions. So this is where we want our countries to be by, in many cases, 2030. And in Qatar's case, what they're saying is, this is how we're going to get our country there. So we're going to use sport, and we're going to use sport as a way of developing industry. So for those of you who are thinking, well, why did the Qataris buy Paris Saint-Germain? Well, there are lots of reasons for it, but one of the, one of the reasons is they're, they're keen to develop uh, entities that can be part of the global sport industry and can develop sustainable revenue streams. We also know that in, in the case of Qatar in particular, they have an events-driven strategy. So it's very much around um, um, bidding for the likes of the World Cup 
because it enables them to, uh, to develop infrastructure. And that's a very interesting one. Why do you need to host the World Cup to be able to build a metro system? Well, that's just the way the world works. As, as I'm sure you realize, you know, politically, sometimes getting projects like uh, a metro system developed, these things take years, they take decades, sometimes they don't happen. But what Qatar has done is to use an integrated strategy whereby their World Cup venues are effectively um, stadiums that connect all of their metro, metro lines together and they're now building their metro lines. Now I'm not going to say it's a good thing or a bad thing, but what I am saying is, is it's an enabler. We've already talked about social impact. In Qatar, for instance, as we've already said, disparate, di very disparate population. Um, also, real issues around gender. It's, it's an Islamic country, fairly conservative Islamic country too. There are real divisions between males and females, and sport is one of the ways in which you can address some of those uh, gender issues. As we said, issues around human capital. Um, one of the things that, that they're trying to do as a consequence of hosting the World Cup is using the World Cup as a driver of uh, education, training and development. So when the World Cup is over, they will have trained professionals who will help to sustain the sport industry once, um, once the, the tournament has gone. So what does it all mean? Well, it means, for bid, as we said, bid for global sporting events, reducing economic dependence upon carbon fuel revenues. Because the gas is great, but you're susceptible to rises and fall in, in energy prices. And we've seen that with the, uh, the dip in oil prices over the last decade. Qatar at times has struggled, as have others in the region. It's also a bit of a way of building a sustainable industry, industrial sector. So we, we perhaps take this for granted here in, in Britain, but we have football clubs and we have sponsorship consultancies and we have event management co uh, companies. We have uh, government departments devoted to sport, but in Qatar, they don't. So in terms of building a sustainable industry, industrial sector, this is taking a blank sheet of paper and, and developing the industry. It's about tackling health issues. Qatar has the highest rate of teenage diabetes in the world. Highest rate of teenage diabetes in the world because Kids sit at home, eating, playing console games, too hot to go out. In the middle of summer, it's too hot to go out. And when people do go out, when kids do go out, they go to a local shopping mall, because it's cold in the shopping mall and there's an ice rink. And what do you do when you go to shopping malls? Well, you go to McDonald's, you go to KFC, you go to Burger King, and then when you've got bored with that, you go back home again and you play console games. So they've got a big issue with um, uh, for example, teenage diabetes. So Qatar, just to give you one example of how, how this strategy plays out, is one of only five countries in the world to have a national sports day. So last, last Tuesday, last week, everybody gets the day off work, and you get the day off work on the understanding that you participate in sport on the national sports day. And that's state decreed, and that's the important thing to note, state decreed. Uh, promote tourism. Um, one of the things that the, the government has done is to formulate a strategy for tourism around the World Cup. Because, of course, when you've got the World Cup, you're not just going to go and see games, you're going to want to do other things as well. And so, in terms of the, the coherent, integrated strategy that we've talked about before, um, an important part of this is is to promote tourism. And for those of you, anybody in the room who's been to Dubai, Dubai is exactly, it's exactly the same thing. I think Dubai does it in a different way. So their strategy is much more about, you take Emirates Airlines from Manchester and you're gonna fly to Dubai en route to, I don't know, Tokyo. And what you'll do is because you're passing through Dubai, you'll, take a, you'll spend a night there or two nights there and you'll think, hey, this is great, I'll come back here. And so what we now know is Dubai is one of the biggest and busiest airports in the world. Based upon this kind of network hub notion concept, and Qatar is doing something similar, but it's using sport as the basis for that in a way that I don't think Dubai is. And as we said, it's, it's to, build, to exert soft power. 
um, and to build a nation brand. Now, to understand how those two things, those two last two things work, for the English people in or for the British people in the room, what I always do, I always use my taxi driver test. Whenever I go overseas, I use a taxi driver test. So if I'm in a taxi in China, for example, or in Egypt, and you always sit in the front seat of the taxi and say to the taxi driver, what's your favourite Premier League team? And of course, they're going to say to you, well, it's United, or it's Chelsea, or it's Arsenal, or I hate City. And then what, what will happen is, even if they don't like football, and even if they don't support a Premier League team, they will have a view. They will have an opinion. And they will tell you, I, well, I, I like the Premier League, but I prefer, I prefer La Liga more. So it instigates a conversation. And that's essentially what these two things are about. So England is very, you know, is, is known for the Premier League and it's known for, you know, it's known for those clubs and it's known for the stars and it's known for the, for the fast, aggressive style of play. And people talk about this. And the British government uses these two, uses football for these two purposes. You know, the British government sends trade missions to, to places like China and to places like Saudi Arabia with the Premier League. And they use the Premier League as a vehicle for, for, for trading, for selling. And the Qataris are trying to do the same thing. So what do we know? In, in, terms, of, in terms of the vision and in terms of the strategy, what do we know about Qatar? Well, again, it's, it's hard to kind of put it all together, but we know they've won the right to stage the World Cup. That's part of, part of their event-driven strategy. So their strategy is, is using events to drive uh, what they're trying to do. We know, too, that they've bought Paris Saint-Germain. What do we know about this guy? The interesting thing is, is, is this guy cost £198 million pounds when, at the time, the world transfer record was, what, about £90 million? I think it was about £90 million. So it didn't just double the world transfer record. It more than doubled the world transfer record. And the Qataris didn't need to do this. So they could have probably could have got Neymar for 110 or 120 or 130 million, but what they did is they more than doubled the world transfer record. And what you might have noticed, noticed when this happened is people stopped talking about Saudi Arabia and people stopped talking about the United Arab Emirates. And people stopped talking about the Premier League for a while. And what they did talk about is they talked about Neymar and Paris Saint-Germain. So this was part of the soft power effect. It was about presenting the nation as a nation that is, is wealthy. And if it wants the best, it can buy the best. And this is how this particular country has used, in this case, an individual and a football club and a transfer as a way of shaping people's perceptions and thoughts and attitudes about the nation and about the entities that they've invested into. And certainly if, uh, if you Google it or you look at my Twitter timeline, I, I, I write about, I talk about Neymar as a soft power, um, uh, as a soft power instrument. So basically that was about influencing people's perceptions of the country. That's not good again. There we are. So what else have they bought? Or what else have they um, invested in? Well, a number of things. But I, I want to pick, pick up these. So sponsorships. So anybody know a Redu? One person. What do a Redu do? I think I do. Is it the National like, State Telecom? Company? Yeah, it is. National State Telecoms Company. So why would anybody need to know about a Redu State Telecoms Company? Well, for, if you're going to go to Qatar in 2022, you can buy two SIM cards, a Vodafone SIM card or an Redu SIM card. Um, but a Redu uh, is seeking to enter new markets. And if you, you're interested in this and you, you look further into it, you will see that a Redu is now investing overseas. 
And it's not inconceivable that in 10 years or 15 years' time, when you go to uh, Manchester City Centre, you won't be buying T-Mobile or Vodafone or whatever. You'll be buying an Aredu phone with an Aredu SIM card. So this is all about, as I said, this is all about broader industrial development. It's not just about, well, hey, let's just stick a couple of logos on the, uh, on the shirt so people know. This is about the tangible industrial development, new market entry, brand awareness, and ensuring that there is some longevity to Cathery industry and some depth to Cathery industry that goes beyond gas and oil. You might also have seen QMB. Oh, wait a minute, QMB. Anyone want to go on? So Cathar National Bank. Anyone got a Cathar National Bank, Cathar National Bank bank account? No, I guess not. But that doesn't matter because the longer term objective is that when I come back in 20 years, if I'm still here, and I ask the question, who's got a QMB account, that some of you will say, well, yeah, I've got a QMB account. And you're going to walk away from here tonight, and you'll know these two names. You'll know Aredu, and you'll know, you'll know QN, QNB. And so it is all about raising profile, establishing presence, and ultimately about becoming a major player. So you'll be choosing between HSBC and uh, Barclays and QNB. Anybody flown on Qatar Airways? Thoughts on Qatar Airways? Good? So good. So if you've never been on Qatar Airways, go on Qatar Airways. Consistently, consistently voted the best airline in the world. State-owned. So if you're state-owned airline seeking to convey an image of being best, the best in the world through a sponsorship deal, what do you do? Well, you sign a sponsorship deal with, at the time, the best club in the world. So again, the important part of this, this really goes back, to, goes back to the Gazprom example. The important part of this is that the Barcelona sponsorship, and for that matter, Boca Juniors, the Boca Juniors shirt sponsorship, the best in Argentina. Roma, the best in Italy. Well, yeah, kind of, kind of. So what they're doing, what the state is doing, what the Qatari state is doing, is to use sponsorships and its associations with teams and with clubs to accentuate this notion of it's the best in the world. And that's really what the Qataris want you to, to, to see when you look at them. They want you to conclude that this country is, is the best in the world, that believes in high quality. So going back to the, the, the point we made about a nation brand, this is what, you to want, they, what, what they want you to think about their nation brand. It's about good quality, it's about the best, it's about best service, best products, linking it to Neymar, the best players. So this is their brand proposition. Sorry, I'm from a marketing background. This is their brand proposition. Now this, it's, it's, it's a little difficult to see. <coughs> so I'm not going uh, to kind of work through this. This is actually a network. And if you want to look at this network, I'm going to show you something in a short while. But essentially what, what I did with a, a, a colleague was to begin to, to, we undertook a social network analysis of, of Qatar and its sports investments. Um, as I say, I'll give you a, a, um, a link to this. But what we begin to see that certainly Qatar Airways, uh, Paris Saint-Germain, Aredu, Qatar National Bank are particularly important. You'll notice, for example, at the top, there are relationships with uh, equine sports, also down at the bottom, with the likes of Bayern Munich and so forth. So sport very quickly has become an important part of, of who Qatar is and what it does. And if you want to know more about this network, you want to look at it a little more. If you look at the Asia and Pacific Policy Forum, if you go into Google and you put Simon Chadwick Asia in the Pacific Policy Forum, um, you will find uh, not only that network and the article relating to that network, but a, a whole bunch of others too. So this kind of gives it away. What I've done is to talk about Qatar as an example of this eastward shift in sport, this Asian, in brackets, Ur, Eurasian uh, development of sport. But we could equally look towards Saudi Arabia. For those of you who are really interested in global sport and you want to know what's going to happen next, Saudi Arabia. 
for me, this is really interesting because obviously the, the, uh, the Jamal Khashoggi um, murder is, uh, is something that seems to have stalled uh, the development of Saudi Arabian sport. But I think we're already beginning to see some developments from that. A French company, uh, for example, today signed a major sponsorship deal in Saudi Arabian football. Uh, but Saudi Arabia, same. Uh, we've mentioned Abu Dhabi, same. Bahrain, same. China, Kazakhstan. So for those of you uh, who know very little about Kazakhstan sport, just to give you one example, um, sports like rugby, real uh, huge investment being in, made into to rugby in Kazakhstan. Singapore uh, has built a sports hub. And again, for, for those of you who know very little about Singapore, you know, Singapore, Singapore is relatively small, big financial centre, um, but essentially what they're trying to do is to promote the development of the country through sport. Azerbaijan, if you're uh, a football fan and you know Atletico Madrid, you may remember the Atletico Madrid Azerbaijan Land of Fire shirt, shirt sponsorship deal. Crucially, Azerbaijan Tourism Authority, state owned, Malaysia, and many more. So, what are their common characteristics? Well, first thing is, is, is be careful not to talk about these countries as emerging countries or emerging economies, because they're not. I would argue that they are emergent at least, but in many cases have actually emerged. So significant economic strength, uh, infrastructurally very strong very often, increasingly global political influence, geopolitical influence, and so on. Some people might refer to them as rentier states, which essentially means states that earn rents overseas. So if you think about Abu Dhabi, for example, and its investment in Manchester City, you know, that's a classic rentier state relationship in the sense that what Abu Dhabi is trying to do, relatively small, um, relatively small population, relatively small country, it's seeking to generate economic and financial rents from overseas assets. An alternative view is that these countries are, for those of you who are into resource theories, that what they're doing is they're acquiring resources. So Qatar has no brand. Go back uh, 20 years ago and you ask, ask someone about the, ask the question, what's brand Qatar? And people wouldn't be able to tell you. So what you do is you buy Paris Saint-Germain and you buy Neymar and you invest in horse racing in Europe. So what you're doing is you're acquiring brand resources. Or if you want political influence in Europe, what you do is you acquire sports teams. And the, the guy who owns uh, Paris Saint-Germain, NASA, has effectively done that. He's bought political influence. And this is very characteristic of resource acquisition. So they're buying resources. This is absolutely vital, state-led. I think it's by way of comparison, just to, to say that the United States has no sports ministry. So the United States and the model of US sport is based around the market. The market determines, the market dictates sporting decisions. But in Asia, it's state-led. So Aredu, state-owned. Qatar Airways, state-owned. Qatar National Bank, state-owned. Paris Saint-Germain, state-owned. Al Sadd, the leading team in uh, Qatar, effectively state-owned. World Cup will be run by the state. Not by the Qatari Football Association, but by the government. It will be run by the state. So this is very important. We've talked about these things very much about the business and industrial development of, of sport. We know that they're trying to build uh, geopolitical influence and soft power, diplomatic uh, relationships through sport. But this one, is, I think this one is really important to emphasize too. Effectively what they're doing is they're, they're mitigating risk. So for those of you who are from a finance background or a strategy background, by investing in um, assets offshore, they're mitigating risk. 
Because if you keep assets onshore, particularly given the unstable nature sometimes of the Gulf region, and we know that there are some fairly problematic parts of the Middle East, you know, in places like Syria, so what they're doing is they're mitigating risk and diversifying, they're, they're investing offshore. And this is very characteristic of, not just Qatar, but if you think about China and Chinese investments in European football, or Chinese investments in FIFA sponsorships, or if you think about, for example, all those stories about the Saudi Arabian government, and they were there yesterday again, so on the BBC website, the headline news was uh, Prince Mohammed denies that Saudi Arabia is going to buy Manchester United. So you know, it may well be that Saudi Arabia is on the cusp of buying Manchester United. So S Manchester United will be owned by a Middle Eastern government, which is somewhat ironic given that at the moment they're, they're owned by North American sports entrepreneurs. So people who are used to operating in a free market, a free sports market. So these, are, these, I would argue, are the common characteristics, not just of Qatar, but of China, of Saudi Arabia, and, and many others. So what does this all mean? Well, eastward pivot, geopoliticization, states involved. Um, this one's really interesting because if you know anything about financial fair play, you have financial fair play and Paris Saint-Germain, you will know that Paris Saint-Germain have breached UEFA financial fair play regulations. And yet two weeks ago, the owner of Paris Saint-Germain was appointed to uh, the FIFA Council and will now sit um, on the same kind of panel that won't hear cases around, for example, financial fair play. So in terms of governance, that's a really interesting one. So your club has breached regulations. So the club that you owned, that you own, has breached regulations, and yet you're going to sit in the kind of governance meetings that will make a judgment on those breaches. So I think it's a really interesting thing. There are some really interesting issues around governance. There are really interesting things around market skewing interventions, power and control. Qatar didn't need to break the world transfer record. They didn't need to do that, but they did. And what that has done, and you know, so effectively what happens is Paris Saint-Germain buys Neymar from Barcelona. Barcelona buys Coutinho from, uh, uh, from Liverpool. Liverpool buy Van Dijk from Southampton. So you get this trickle out effect or this trickle down effect that skews the market. So that Salford City, in the end, instead of having to pay £50,000 for a player, ends up having to pay £100,000 for a player, or £200,000. So the importance of this, and the importance of what China is doing, Saudi Arabia is doing, Abu Dhabi is doing, is you get these market skewing interventions and, and issues of power and control. But going back to this one, as we drifted off it, so what will happen is NASA at Paris Saint-Germain, the owner of Paris Saint-Germain, and we've already seen this, will cut a deal. So, breach financial fair play rules, but has actually cut a deal. Just as Manchester City, Abu Dhabi state owned, breached financial fair play regulations, breached the rules, but nevertheless cut a deal. And for those of you who are interested in global diplomacy and how the world works, we're beginning to see this more and more, where rules don't matter anymore. What matters is the ability to make a deal. And Donald Trump is prime, this is not just an Asian thing. You look at Donald Trump, Donald Trump is a prime example of someone who doesn't believe in rules. What he does is he cuts, cuts deals. So, conclusions. Is it the end of Europe? I'll leave you to decide. Is it the end of Western liberalism? Possibly. Because this is not private football clubs or private sports clubs. This is state-owned entities challenging the way that we've always done things. Now, you go to Asia and they'll say, great. Europeans have had it too, too good for too long. Or North Americans have had it too good for too long. So one view could be that it's a more egalitarian world. But I think we are in the middle of some, something really profound 
the best, the best run club in this country, the best run club in this country is owned by a foreign government. The currently most successful club in this country is, is owned by a foreign government. So there are interesting things around profound change, government organization management. I think this, this one I want to pick out is it's an inconvenient truth, particularly for those of us that were born and brought up in the town of the club that we support. And I'm looking at the British people in the room. It's our team, right? So you're born and you die. That club, that's your club. You're born, you know, you're born red, you die red. You're born blue, you die blue. But the inconvenient truth is that the government that owns your club the Asian government that owns your club may not have the same loyalties or association or associations or affinities that you do. And that's an inconvenient truth. And nobody has stopped that. The European Union didn't stop it. The British government didn't stop it. The Premier League didn't stop it. The Football Association didn't stop it. And so now we have this situation of sometimes communities communities here, domestic communities, feeling alienated, feeling as though it's not their club anymore, feeling as though big money has spoilt the beautiful game. How do we get out of it? Well, you know, that's another, another, another question, another debate for another day. So if you want to read some more, if you're not already following on Twitter or you, you're unaware of these things, uh, I write for the Economic Journal about things like airline sponsorships, state-owned airlines and their sponsorships of sport. In this particular case, it's about how Chinese buyers effectively bought West Brom and Wolverhampton Wanderers and AC Milan and Inter Milan and Den Haag and uh, Espanyol and Atletico Madrid and what the consequences of that are. Um, a book, if you're interested in what's happening in the world and wanna, want some context of how this all is, I, uh, I read this recently, this is really good. This is how it, somebody from Asia sees the world. And there is talk about sport and how sport fits into this. So if you're, you're interested to this kind of thing, I'd recommend that you look at it. Uh, this is in the library, I think. Um, there are some of us in the room, apart from me put, having my name on the, on the front cover, there are, there are others in the room here who've written chapters uh, for this. So there's a chapter on Qatar, there's a chapter on Turkey, there's a chapter on China. Um, and I would recommend that you look at it. This is coming soon. And so I, I wrote a chapter for this on the business and industrial development of sport in the Gulf region. So if you want to know more about what I've talked about today, um, by all means, take a look at that. Uh, so if you'd like to join me in thanking Simon. get the picture in uh, and there will be uh, a chance for follow-up questions conversation over some drinks and canapes back out in the reception thank you all for attending <laughs>